Hi, in my last video, I built these modular shop cabinets that can be reconfigured and bolted together in different ways. And in this video, I want to talk about the design and why I built them the way that I did. This is one module, one cabinet. So let's start by talking about the design of this first. So the overall dimensions of the cabinet are 508 millimeters square by 342 millimeters tall. So why those dimensions? 508 millimeters is exactly 20 inches. And I wanted these to kind of work for everybody. So they are a metric design, but I wanted them to still be able to integrate into a shop that primarily uses Imperial. Also, I'm gonna talk about hole spacing a little bit later, but the holes are one fourth of the way across the cabinet. So it was important that the dimension was divisible by four, both in inches and metric. The holes are five inches from the edge of the cabinet. They're 127 millimeters. So it's a whole number in both systems. Also this, I showed you this drawer in the last video, but basically the inside of this drawer is exactly 450 millimeters wide. And then when you add nine millimeters for the sides of the drawer, two millimeters of clearance, and then 18 millimeters for the side of the cabinet. 508 is just what you end up with. That happens to come out really nicely because that allows me to make the inside of the drawer 450 by 375 so that it's divisible by these 75 millimeter boxes. The other reason that I chose these horizontal dimensions was because of the amount of overhang that I want for a tabletop. I feel like a 24 inch deep tabletop is pretty common. I made the cabinets 20 so that there's a four inch overhang and that gives me plenty of room to put a clamp on it like this. Now there's of course a bit of a trade-off here because this kind of blocks access to the back of the top drawer, but the intention was always to have a bit of space in here to make room for clamps so that I'm not blocking the top drawer with the clamp. And I mean, ultimately there's just a trade-off here. I could put more vertical space which would make the back of this top drawer more accessible, but that's just wasting space here. I could make there be less overhang, which makes the back of the top drawer more accessible, but it leaves less room for clamps. And I did that on my last big cabinet and I didn't like it. So I wanted more overhang here. So I feel like this was sort of the best balance I could find where the back of the drawer is reasonably accessible. There's not too much wasted space here and I have enough overhang. So yeah, the amount of overhang here is what got me in the rough ballpark of this size. And then metric and inches coinciding at 508 millimeters is what got me to that specific dimension. The reason for the 342 millimeter height is a little bit more interesting because there are a lot of dimensions that involve the height. You have the drawer slide spacing, you have the thickness of the top and the bottom, and you also have the hole spacing here. So basically the holes in the sides for joining the cabinets together have to go in between the drawer slides. Because of that, the hole spacing is going to be a multiple of the drawer slide spacing. And in this case, I chose a multiple of three. Now I'll come back to this in a minute, but I wanted the overall height of the cabinet to be a multiple of these holes spacing. The drawer slides are 38 millimeter spacing, which makes these holes be 114 millimeters, and 114 times three is 342. So that's how you get the overall height. But of course, the height also needed to work out with the height that you want workbenches and desks and stuff to be. That was just kind of a matter of trial and error, trying a lot of things in CAD and figuring out what was the most versatile height. So I said that the thickness of the top and bottom matter when we're talking about the overall height. The reason for that is I wanted the two of them added up to be the same as a drawer. So the drawer slide spacing is 38 millimeters, which means if I leave a two millimeter clearance between the drawers, the shallowest drawers are 36 millimeters overall height. I'm using 18 millimeter Baltic birch. So when you stack two of those, it's 36 millimeters, which basically means across two cabinets like this, you have equal drawer slide spacing all the way. Well, there's one slide missing here, but if you can imagine there being a slide here, they would be an even 38 millimeters all the way across. So yeah, the top of one cabinet and the bottom of the next effectively just replace one drawer. So the overall height of the cabinet is the same as nine drawer slot spacings or three hole spacings. So because the overall height of the cabinet is a multiple of the hole spacing, that means that the holes across this gap are the same spacing as the holes in the cabinets. So these are all evenly spaced, no matter how many cabinets you stack up. There's one more number that corresponds to the height that also matters, 
and that is the height of these feet. You'll notice that the height corresponds to the hole spacing. Or the other way to say this is the height of the wood part is equal to three drawer slot spacings. Okay, why does all of this matter? Let me show you. So here we have two pairs of cabinets. One of them is up on the risers and the other is not. And you'll see these drawer slides still line up perfectly across the seam. And it's not just the drawer slides. Since the feet offset the higher cabinet by exactly one hole spacing, that means the holes still line up so I can bolt them together. You may have noticed earlier that these feet have the wood riser part, but then they have a leveling foot on the bottom. And the height of that wood part without the leveling foot is what corresponds to the hole spacing. So what that means is when I'm using this configuration, I have the same leveling feet under this cabinet as what I have on this riser. So the cabinets aren't sitting directly on the floor. If you want the cabinets to sit directly on the floor, you just also let the riser sit directly on the floor. So the height of this riser without the leveling foot comes right to the bottom of the cabinet. So I'm just using the same leveling foot, just with a nut and washer on the bottom side and a nut on the inside. And it might seem like having these just threaded into the cabinet wouldn't give you very much adjustment, but it's actually pretty decent. This one is still in there by about a thread. And of course this nut isn't really taking very much load, so it's okay if that's not in by very far. And this one, it is sticking out a little bit, but it's not sticking out as much as this drawer slide. So the drawer still won't hit this. And that gives me about 10 millimeters or a little over 3 8 inch of difference. I'm using elevator bolts as the leveling foot because they're really cheap and easy to find. But you can of course use an actual leveling foot if you want. And again, just use the same one in this as you use in the cabinet. I made these caster feet one inch or 25 millimeters taller than the hole spacing and that way they end up being the same height as these with the leveling foot. And the vertical dimension does still integrate nicely into a shop that uses primarily imperial because the slot spacing at 38 millimeters is essentially 1.5 inch. The hole spacing at 114 millimeters is essentially 4.5 inches and the overall height at 342 is essentially 13.5 inches. So now hopefully you understand my logic behind this vertical hole spacing, but what about the horizontal hole spacing? So I already mentioned that these holes are one fourth of the way across the cabinet, but why would I put them that far from the edge? Because if I put them right in the corners, that would be quite a bit stronger. Well, the reason I put them where I did is I want to be able to make half width cabinets as well as half depth cabinets. By having them one fourth of the way across, they'll be centered on those half width cabinets. If I wanted to make these cabinets sort of future proof and make them compatible with half width cabinets, but have the bolts in the corners, that would mean that I would also need to have a bolt hole here for the other corner of that half width cabinet. So that means I need 12 bolt holes around the edges instead of just four in the center. Now, 12 versus four might not sound that bad, but when you also need to do that to the bottom, and it's also doubling the number of holes on all the sides, it ends up being 76 total holes in the cabinet. And that just sounds ridiculous to me, so that's why I put them here, so that they're in the center of the half-width cabinets. So I can bolt the cabinets together like this with a half offset, and if we come around to the back and look at this, you'll see this row of holes lines up all the way. And while we're talking about holes, I might as well talk about these holes that are for mounting the feet. These are 30 millimeters from the edge and then a 60 millimeter square spacing. So why those dimensions? Well, first you need to know that these feet are indexable. So here you can see I have them all the way on the outside corners and the cabinet is really stable this way. It doesn't want to tip. However, they're kind of in the way and they don't provide any toe kick right at the corner. So this position makes the cabinet slightly more likely to tip forward, but it also gives me a little bit more toe kick. However, it doesn't have any toe kick from the side. Orienting the feet this way does make the cabinet substantially less stable but it gives me plenty of toe kick from both the front and the side. So determining what I wanted the actual hole spacing to be was pretty much a matter of determining how far from the corner I wanted the center of the bolt pattern to be. If this center was too far from the corner, then indexing it is gonna look more like this, which is gonna give me a completely unnecessary amount of toe kick 
and also make the cabinet way less stable. And if this pivot point is closer to the corner, then it doesn't give me enough toe kick in these alternative positions. So this was just a matter of experimenting in CAD and deciding what gave me the best balance of toe kick and stability. And then once I had determined where I wanted the center to be, it was basically a matter of putting the bolts as far from that center point as they can be for stability. And as for the design of the holes themselves, they're a nine millimeter or three eighths inch diameter hole with about a 18 to 20 millimeter or three quarter inch diameter counter bore. And this is just designed so that I can use a quarter inch or M6 bolt with some hardened washers. The washers fit with just a bit of play and then the bolt has a bit of play in the washer. So this gives me a little bit of wiggle room so that the holes don't have to be in absolutely the perfect position. And all of the holes, the ones for mounting the feet and for mounting all the cabinets together are all identical. That way I can use the same length of bolt for mounting cabinets to each other and for mounting feet to cabinets and everything. The bolts that I use are one inch or 25 millimeter length and that way I can put them in between the cabinets like this and they don't stick out on either side so they're fully within the walls of the cabinet. Let's talk about the construction of the cabinet itself. Some people in my last video asked why I made the sides overlap the top and bottom instead of the other way around. If the bottom had been under the side and then the top was over the side, that should transfer the load better and be stronger. There's two reasons for that. The first is the internal width is really critical, and the second is the bottom drawer slot is really close to the bottom. So this is what that joint would look like if I did it that way. So you can see part of the problem already because this is really flimsy because the bottom drawer slot is so close to the bottom of the cabinet, but also there's nothing to set the distance this way. So I would be relying on just trying to measure the internal width which is not really accurate enough and likely the drawers are going to end up either having too much slop or binding because the width isn't right. By making the top and bottom sit between the sides, I can just cut the width of these using the table saw and when I butt the sides up against those, that gives me a precise interior width. The interior height doesn't really matter as much. The other thing that several people asked about is why I didn't use rabbits on these joints. Why did I just use a butt joint here? because by using a butt joint, that meant I had to measure the internal width and having a rabbit would have just automatically set that for me. Well, here's what that joint would have looked like. And it's basically the same two problems. I am introducing extra error by having a rabbit here because if that's not the right depth, then that's gonna make the interior width of my cabinet wrong. And this bottom drawer slide is very weak. Creating a joint like this fixes that problem because now this is strong enough. And it also fixes the problem of getting a precise measurement this way. However, the problem with this design is where do you put the screws? How do you attach it together? Because ideally you would put the screw in this direction so that you're pulling the side really tightly against this edge of the rabbit to get a precise interior width. But you about have to put the screw on an angle or something. It's gonna be kind of a pain to do. The way to get around that problem is to just make the rabbit super deep and now you have a place to put the screw. The problem that I see with this is just that you're losing the advantage of the side sitting on the bottom because this isn't strong enough to support any weight and this is kind of inefficient. You're just wasting a lot of material cutting out all of that. So the only advantage to doing it this way is that it does set the dimension in both directions so that you don't have to measure when you're assembling it. So if that's worth it to you, this isn't a bad idea. This is a, this is a good way to do it, but you have to decide if it's worth wasting that much material for it. The other minor problem with having the top and bottom overlapping the side in any way, whether it be a rabbit or fully overlapping, that makes them a full 20 inches wide. And if you're using a five by five sheet of plywood, then you can't get three of them out of the width. So you can't use the material nearly as efficiently as you can if these are that much narrower. And I got a few questions in the last video about the five by five sheets, because some people had never heard of those and I don't blame you, they're kind of just a Baltic birch thing. As far as I know, only Baltic birch comes in five by fives. But in my experience, at least here in the US, five by fives are more common than four by eights for Baltic birch. My old wood store in Arizona only had five by fives and the wood store here in Washington has both four by eights and five by fives, 
but they have a wider selection of thicknesses in 5x5s. Five five so yeah, of course you can use either 4x8s or 5x5s, five five it works fine. I just kind of optimized the design for what I perceived as the more common sheet size. So one of the things I was curious about is how much it would sag when it's configured this long. Let's see if we can find out. Sighting along this, it's much harder with a camera than it is with my eyes. It does seem to be sagging very slightly, but that could also just be that I have the middle two cabinets a little bit lower. I might not have aligned them super well when I put them together because the holes are oversized. So I think what's gonna be a better test is if I put a ruler against the center right here, and then I'll get back here so you can see what I'm doing, but I'm gonna put the camera right up close here, and then I'm gonna sit right here, putting my full weight on it. There's nothing underneath supporting it, so we'll find out how much it sags when I add my weight here. All right, so there's the close-up of the ruler against the cabinet, and I'm gonna sit as close to that as I can right in the center. So this is my full weight right on the front edge in the center. And then getting back off, sitting back on it, getting back off. So yeah, that deflected about 1 16th of an inch with 150 pounds right in the middle. Personally, I don't think that's too bad, but if you're concerned about it, you can put a piece of square tubing or a two by four or something along underneath, under the toe kick. Basically what I would do is use this hole and then run a two by four all the way down to this hole, but of course on, on the bottom, on the corresponding holes in the bottom. So that'll support that really well underneath. So here we're looking at an upside down cabinet and you'll see that both of these feet are designed to not interfere with that particular hole, specifically for that reason. I wanna be able to put a two by four all the way to this hole, the very last hole on the last cabinet, even if I have a caster foot in this position. One more thing about the cabinets before we move on to talking about the drawers. There's a reason that I made the cabinet in two sections instead of just one 27 inch tall cabinet. There's a reason that I made it two pieces. The obvious reason is that it's more versatile because I can stack three of them to make a standing desk or I can use just a single one as a tool stand. It gives me more flexibility, but there is another reason. If this side were to span all the way from the top up here, all the way to the bottom down here, that's too long a span and it will end up warping over time, warping inward or outward and making these center drawers either too loose or too tight. And I say that with confidence because that happened on my old workbench in my old shop. So my initial design was gonna be to have this entire height in a single, 27 inch tall thing. But then I was trying to figure out how to support it. I was gonna put something on here to thicken up the side, which seemed really inefficient. And then I decided to try to put something across the middle to connect the two sides so they can't bow. And then that's kind of where I came up with the idea to just split it into two pieces, because if I'm gonna have something in the middle anyway, it might as well just be two pieces and that increases the versatility. Let's talk about the drawers. I think maybe the first thing to address, since I promised I would in the last video, is the false back and why I have this. Since these drawers don't have any kind of expensive full extension slides, it's important that you stop pulling the drawer before you get it too far out. The farther out you get, the lower the capacity of the drawer because you're putting a lot more leverage on the little bit of drawer slide that's left inserted. So I have this false back at about the 80% mark. I think actually this is 81% of the drawer and this is 19%. This false back serves as a visual stop line to show you where to stop pulling. And it also keeps all of your stuff in the front part of the drawer so that you're not tempted to pull it out further than you should to try to reach the stuff that's in the back. On some of my earlier drawer projects, some people were asking me why I don't just put stops, physical hard limits. That's partly just for simplicity because I don't wanna to have to make the stops, but it's also partly because I wanna be able to easily just take these drawers out and take them to where I'm working without having to deactivate some sort of stop. And that space in the back is not completely useless. Pardon the mess, but Often I use the space in the back for stuff that is relevant to what's in the drawer. So for example, I have these socket sets and they have these plastic covers that go over them. I don't want to get rid of these just in case I ever want to sell these. I just store them back here because I'm not going to be needing them anytime soon. Also, I have some pencils here, but back in the back I have the whole package of pencils. So that's the kind of stuff that I use this back space for. It's relevant to what's in the front, but not frequently needed. And I can say that after having this style of drawers with the false backs in my shop for about six and a half years now, 
I have never accidentally pulled one all the way out. So the drawers fit into the cabinet with a two millimeter clearance on all sides and two millimeters of clearance between the drawers. Part of the reason for this is because I wanted the top and bottom of the cabinet to add up to one drawer. Those are 36 millimeters. And then I wanted the slot spacing to be 38 since that is essentially 1.5 inches. And so that leaves a two millimeter clearance. However, there is kind of another reason to it because on my old workbench cabinet, I left 1 16th inch clearance between the drawers and that ended up being a little bit too small. I'll come back to why in a second, but then on my belt grinder cabinet, I left an eighth inch of clearance between them. And I felt like that was too much. An eighth inch of clearance just lets a lot of dust in and it's unnecessary. So a two millimeter clearance is a tiny bit more than my 1 16th inch that was too little, but it's still quite a bit less than the eighth inch that was too much. So why was 1 16th inch not enough? Well, if I had one of the drawers loaded up with a lot of weight, it would make the bottom sag just a tiny bit and it would make it sag a 16th of an inch. And what that meant is when I opened the drawer below it, the false back of the drawer below would hit the sagging bottom of the drawer above it. And as you can see in this clip, that pulls that top drawer open with the bottom drawer, which is really annoying. That's much less of an issue the other way around because if you're opening the drawer that has the sagging bottom and it drags on the front of the drawer below it, that's not as much of an issue because it's pushing down on the drawer below it, which increases the friction with the slides. So that drawer doesn't really tend to open with the top drawer. But the other way around, when you're opening the lower drawer, it pushes up on the upper drawer and takes the weight off of the slides which is why that drawer wants to open with it. I kind of fixed that in two ways here. My old cabinet was only using six millimeter plywood bottoms and this one's using nine millimeter. So these are not gonna sag as much. And then I've also increased the gap between them by about 30%. There is one more thing that I've done to help mitigate this problem. It's kind of hard to show, but the drawer backs are actually one millimeter lower than the sides. So the back and false back actually have three millimeters of clearance from the drawer above them, whereas the front and sides of the drawer only have two millimeters of clearance. It actually wouldn't really matter if the backs were like five millimeters lower than the front. It doesn't matter if there's a lot of clearance on the back because the back is not what's keeping the dust out. It's the front that you need a really small gap to keep the drawers clean. I considered making the drawer front extend past the bottom, so that it would basically cover up that sag, if that makes sense, and reduce this gap. But since I'm basically already able to reduce it down to two millimeters, I could only gain about another millimeter by overhanging the front. And one millimeter less clearance isn't enough to be worth it because overhanging the front would mean that I can't use the bottom as the handle. And it also means that it would be a lot harder to use this jig to form the drawer box. The tight clearances do help to keep dust out, but they also have an unintended consequence. There's not very much room for air to escape. So the air that a drawer displaces, especially a big drawer, when you try to close it quickly, the air doesn't really have anywhere to go. So this can happen. This only really happens if this drawer is empty, but it is kind of interesting. And this only happens with the largest of the drawers. These smaller drawers don't push enough air. I did find that leaving these drawer slots exposed on the back and also having these holes open does make a lot of difference on this air pressure issue. Here I'm setting up an absolute worst case scenario. So every hole where air could escape is taped. The smaller drawer is empty and I'm opening it a little bit to allow the air to get behind it easily. If I add a little bit of weight to the upper drawer, and then close the lower drawer at a speed that's not completely insane, there's no problem. And this is even with all of those holes still taped. The drawer slots are designed to have one millimeter of clearance with the drawer slide side to side and one millimeter of clearance up and down. So that gives you enough room that you can make the drawer up to 0.5 millimeter too wide and make one of the cabinets up to 0.5 millimeter too narrow and that widest drawer should still work with that narrowest cabinet. And vice versa, if you make the drawer a half a millimeter too narrow and the cabinet a half a millimeter too wide, they're still gonna work with each other. They'll be a little loose, but they'll work. Similarly with the vertical clearance, I find that the nine millimeter plywood that I've been getting usually tends to be just a little over, maybe 9.3. So I can make the slot up to half a millimeter too narrow vertically, and the thickest bottoms will still fit in that slot. It doesn't matter quite as much if you make the vertical height of the drawer slides way too tall. 
That's just gonna make the drawer a little bit looser and it will make it tip down more when you extend it. Tipping down doesn't really hurt anything except that if it tips down too much, the back of the drawer could hit the bottom of the drawer above it, especially if that drawer is sagging. But again, making the drawer backs a little bit lower than the drawer fronts helps with that. A few people in my last video asked why I didn't make the drawer fronts extend over the sides and cover up the carcasses with them, because that would have given a cleaner look. First, I want to just say that I personally embraced the look. I like how this looks. I think the exposed slides give it character or something. I also like the exposed plywood edges and especially the fact that these drawers also have the exposed plywood. I think it just looks cool. But aside from that, it does have functional reasons, of course. So first of all, I wanted the drawers to bottom out at the back of the cabinet rather than catching at the front. And the reason for that is, once again, something that I learned from my old cabinet that was starting to fail after a few years. When this small overhanging front edge takes all of the impact of closing all the time, it starts to break off. These were on my old scrap storage drawers, but here you can also see it happening on my newer cabinet. And it's not just the drawers that I make. Here's an old drawer in my parents' house. So yeah, these drawers were always going to bottom out at the back instead of hitting on the front anyway. Although it would be possible to make the fronts overhang if you wanted to, and just make them not hit. Make it bottom out at the back before the fronts hit. But What's the point? Regarding the aesthetics, one thing that I did to try to make this look a little bit nicer was trimming all of these drawer slides back a little bit so that when they're closed, you don't see them. Over here is one of my prototype cabinets. So this is a really early version that I built a couple years ago. And you can see I just cut these back at 45 degrees. And from a distance, those slides all look like they're filled up. And I don't really like how that looks. I think this looks cleaner with all of the slides looking the same, whether there's a drawer there or not. Trimming this slide back does also serve a purpose because when I'm trimming this end off using a flush trim router bit, this gives it clearance to start all the way off the end. These handles are very slim. They only stick out 12 millimeters. And that's so that they clear the opposite drawer if you have a 90 degree configuration. On my prototype cabinets, I originally had much longer handles that stuck out really far. And I found that they didn't really help that much with being able to get a hold of them. And they're really ugly. I also banged my knees on those several times. So these slimmer handles are a lot easier to rub against without hurting yourself. Also, if the handles are any longer, I wouldn't be able to get three drawer bottoms out of a 5x5 five five sheet. This is how much extra there is with the current design. The handles have this shallow cove cut into the bottom of them, and adding this made way more difference than having any extra length on the handle. And I think while we're on the subject of how easy it is to open these drawers with these handles, I should show you some footage that I got several months ago of these drawers loaded to a little over 100 pounds. So this will give you an idea how easy they are to open with 100 pounds in them. This also gives you an idea of the weight capacity of these drawers. So this drawer is basically completely level full with solid steel. I weighed all of the steel as I was putting it in here, so I know that it is a little over 100 pounds. It would be pretty much impossible to put any more weight in this drawer without using gold or tungsten. And here you can see that the drawer below it can still easily be opened, so that's not enough to make the bottom sag too much. A lot of people in my last video were asking about these cardboard boxes. I made them myself just by cutting out the cardboard with a template and then wrapping them around a wood block and hot gluing them together. It's a very simple process, but so many people were interested that I think I'll put together a quick video showing how I did it. I figured some of you might be interested in this custom drawer that I made. My porta band is a little bit too big to fit in the front part of the drawer, so I cut it under the false back. 
I still have the false back running all the way across because I want the same sort of visual effect as I'm pulling it out. I want this false back to appear and make me subconsciously think that I need to stop pulling. I think it's still a good idea to have the false back on every drawer just so that your brain processes it the same way. I could be wrong, I don't know how brains work, but that's my theory. And I figure I probably have to talk about the table saw sled drawer. First of all, while we're here, this drawer just has notches cut in it for the slides. So these two drawers will always have to go together, but I'm okay with that. The bottom of this sled is 18 millimeter plywood. So I had to cut a rabbit along the edge to make this a nine millimeter thick slide. And then I also cut a really deep rabbit along the front so that it still has the same appearance of only being nine millimeters thick here. And so the handle is the same as all of the others. And then that also gives it a nice spot for this front fence to sit. It is otherwise a pretty normal and simple sled. I made this part as high as it can be so that I have as much material here as possible for strength. This block protects my fingers, obviously, but it also directs the dust down and into the saw so it's not shooting out the back. It's important that I don't push the sled too far because if I do, then it would cut out the back of this and dust will be coming out the back. So I wanna prevent that. So for that, I made this little block so the sled just hits on that. It just catches the end of the slide. Hopefully this is temporary because I plan to build an actual outfeed table someday, but I haven't got around to that yet. So for now this works. Next to this tall bridge, I have it cut down so the fence is a little bit lower so that I can comfortably hold work pieces like this. The fence is held on with these eight screws and then I just have plywood runners. You'll notice these runners end just a little bit short of the back, and they weren't originally like that. I found that when they came all the way to the back, the drawer was really hard to put back in the cabinet because I was trying to start this slide and this slide and these two runners all at the same time. I have a couple more ideas for some strange custom drawers. One person in my last video, and I'm sorry I can't find your comment again, so if you want credit, feel free to comment again and I'll pin it. But one person suggested that a drawer like this could be used for small benchtop power tools as a way to store them. Something like a grinder or maybe a sharpening setup. You could keep it clean and keep it out of the way whenever you're not using it, and when you need it, you just pull the drawer out and put it on your workbench and use it. I really like that idea. I also have the idea of making a soldering station that's on a drawer. So this would again just be a drawer that's a flat platform as the bottom and a front to hide it and keep it clean. So effectively like this sled, but minus the fence. So I have this nice soldering iron, but it's multiple pieces and cords, and it's kind of a pain to store. So I like the idea of having these things permanently mounted to this drawer. And then I could also have a fume extractor and a third hand type thing, and maybe even some lighting, all permanently installed on the drawer. So whenever I need to solder, I would just pull this drawer out and put it on my desk and instantly have an entire dedicated soldering setup. But when I don't need it, put it away and it all stays clean and out of the way. Well, I think I covered pretty much everything. This turned into a long one. I decided to just kind of pull out all the stops and say everything that I felt like saying in this one, so I hope you didn't hate it. And yes, I kind of just gave away all of my secrets because I gave you every dimension. I think you'll find that the plans are still well worth it, but yeah, I'm sure there's gonna be some people who just rip off the design based on this video, whatever, I hope most people have the decency to not do that. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this. Thanks for watching.